I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello, welcome to Cinema Royale, where there is no Royale, and we talk about cinema all the time. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and boy, this is going to be an interesting episode indeed, since it's the last day of May, it's May 31st, 2015. Uh, let's get into our panel of awesome film aficionados tonight. First up, we got the Canadian, who is back in black, who is not black, awkward introduction. Matt Brunet. Oh, I'm kind of black. I'm blacker than white, like pale white. Oh, I'm black on the inside, in the heart. (laughs) Cause on the inside, I'm a gangster. But y'all already knew that. (laughs) And before we continue, just a fat warning, considering the subject there will be a lot of this impression coming out of me. So just a little bit of an advanced warning. It's also a good training ground for my impressions. So please do understand that I'm just trying my best to keep the theme rolling in here. (laughs) Very well said. Very well said. And... Last but not least on the panel is James Sullivan, also known as Jaime Too. Okay. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by Dr. Jack. The one thing at a party that will make Cards Against Humanity a whole lot more enjoyable. And make you text amusing pictures to your friends. Yes! What? <laughs> yes, I got it. I know! He texted me that picture last night. I'm like, what? <laughs> Yeah, dude. <laughs> what a fridge. New profile picture. <laughs> no, it's not going anywhere. No, come on. That's a nice smile. That's not going in, James. James, that's not going anywhere. You just showed it on freaking YouTube. That's gotta go somewhere. <laughs> Think about that, dude. Yeah. I hope nobody out there has screen capture software. Oh. Um. Anyways, you know, it's Christopher Walken we're going to talk about. Mm hmm. What do you say about Christopher Walken? I mean. Pause for fucking words. Let me. Yes. Christopher Walken. Nowadays, is probably one of the more iconic actors with a very distinctive voice and a distinctive style in his mannerisms. He's definitely one of the most recognizable actors and one of the most iconic as well, with a mixture of memorable good films and also memorable bad films. But also, he has a few things on the side including Saturday Night Live and a few other things. But with that said, we all remember Christopher Walken for many different things. So this here is just a highlight of just several of the beloved works that we just grown to love. No matter how bad or how amazing his talent is, this is about Christopher Walken. Obviously, we don't have all the iconic movies, you know, we might not have, we might not, we not, might not talk about the Deer Hunter, or, you know, because that's his only Oscar-winning role in that film. Only Oscar-winning? Yes. Is it only? Are you yep. sure? I am, I double-checked that motherfucker, yes, it's his only Oscar he ever won for Best Supporting Role in the Deer Hunter. If you look at anything else for any of the movies he's won awards for, it wasn't the oh. Oscars. Oh. Oh, well then. Oh, yeah, okay. see? But if you look it up, you may notice that Catch Me If You Can has the most awards. Which we'll get right into right now. 
So Matt, what mm -hmm. is Catch Me If You Can all about? Now, let me just say that two little mice fell in the bucket of cream. <laughs> one mouse <laughs> fell. One mouse gave up and drowned. The second mouse wouldn't quit. Wouldn't quit. He churned that cream so hard that it turned into butter, and he climbed up and escaped. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that th that the second mouse is this movie. <laughs> no, okay, but anyways, I just had to get that spiel out of the way. Catch me if you can, the 2002 Spielberg film. Uh, definitely quite a fascinating one. And this is one of the good examples of Christopher Walken, like, showing his true talents here. Catch Me If You Can is the movie that is based on the true events of Frank Abagnale Jr., who is pretty much one of the biggest, like, at a very young age, starting at 19 year or, yeah, like, well, like, starting at 18 years old, um, he pretty much, he is one of the biggest con men in America, pretty much uh, conning his way to become a pilot, a doctor, uh, a lawyer, and all that kind of stuff, making pretty much conning millions and millions of dollars just to get his way. And so pretty much, he's a con man. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, pr pretty much. He he'd be a great. Yeah, so uh, expect to see for Frank Abagnale soon at PME. <laughs> no, okay, but anyways. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, but also, while that is happening, uh, while he's doing his con work and stuff like that, Tom Hanks playing, uh, Carl, Carl, Han Carl Hanratty, he is an FBI cop that is searching for the, who is pretty much searching for Frank Abagnale, so it's pretty much this really intriguing, fascinating life of a con man, while that, it's also like this big cat and mouse, like, this big cat and mouse chase. Um, as now, there, of course, there are plenty of great performances, whether it be from Leonardo DiCaprio as Frank Abagnale, um, Tom Hanks, also, uh, Amy Adams, and even the fact that, like I mentioned, there were two Oscar nominations, uh, for Best Score by John Williams and Best Supporting Role for Christopher Walken. Um, I might as well say right now that... Uh, a very interesting fact is that apparently Christopher Walken, I believe he is the first ever actor to be nominated for both an Oscar and a Razzie for that year. Uh, the Oscar nomination, of course, was for this one, and the Razzie was for his wonderful performance in The Country Bears. <laughs> <laughs> so it was the uh... night while he was at the Oscars, he heard that nomination. This is not over! This! <laughs> It had to be said in this podcast. But anyways, mm -hmm. uh, for, for Christopher Walken's performance, he plays uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's father, Frank Abagnale Sr. He's pretty much this, he's pretty much what started and what influenced this entire scenario. Like, um, he, he started out being pretty successful. He was, he made the speech that I, that I began, uh, this discussion with um, pretty much going big but then suddenly he had a divorce he broke up with his wife and half of the fortune is gone so things really aren't looking good Frank Abagnale Jr. he just couldn't handle it and that's what pretty much started this whole journey for him is when he run away from ran away there are times occasionally when he would come back but he just he still wouldn't it, uh, I'm trying I'm not 100% sure, honestly, if this actually ha if this is what happened in the movie, but, like, he tried to come back and tried to show that things are going great, like, things can go back to normal, but as, um, as Christopher Walken would tell Leo that, no, things are not, like, you know, things can't go back to be normal, Thing like, things have to be different, and you have to learn to accept that, and it's, you know, it's really tough for him, like, it's this really interesting father-son relationship that, that admittedly, Leo is going through this very, very tragic event that it really, like, I think for anyone, it's really, really hard to swallow, you know, having, like, divorced parents and, like, part of the fortune is gone, and, like, part of the fortune, like, has to be split, so, like, the li his life 
really is, can't cannot really be better. So he pretty much made his own illegal journey, and it's definitely fascinating. But Christopher Walken is just a small portion, uh, admittedly, like just a small portion to why uh, this is definitely great. Well, like I said, the true stars are definitely Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks in this. So um, if you guys want to get the uh, if you guys do have a chance, if you do want to check out uh, a really interesting Steven Spielberg movie, I couldn't recommend this one more. Okay. Yeah, I, I remembered that. That was uh, that is Steven Spielberg. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen that one yet, but um, I, I still remember the uh, the very blurry uh, poster work that they had for it. Mm-hmm. It sort of became an iconic thing for it. Yeah, and then there's also, like, uh, another iconic thing is, uh, like I said, the uh, John Williams uh, score in this. Like, I'm sure, like, th- there was even at one point when The Simpsons even parodied it. Like, it had a bit of an animated opening where, um, like, like uh, the two chasing, and it's like this minimalistic 60s uh, poster style. It's like, doom, doom. Is that how the music is in the movie, or? Yeah, well, that's how it starts. Yeah, that's how like the score starts. It doesn't sound like John Williams to me. <laughs> well, I mean, he's the one that's nominated for best score. Oh, we... Matt, well, Matt's not John Williams. Give him a break. He can't replicate it right, so he's not perfect. Oh. So that's why it didn't sound like John Williams, because he didn't sound like John Williams. If he sounded like John Williams, it would be a completely different career going. <laughs> yeah, you would have a... Uh... Although I would question my vocal cords and stuff like that, like I can only make sounds with my mouth. I can't make an or I can't make my mouth sound like a, an exact orchestra. Exactly, it would be so weird. I can't. I, yeah, you wouldn't. The spore come out of my mouth. Yeah, you wouldn't. You would not be here. You would be somewhere else. Exactly. That's what far, I'm <laughs> far, uh, far wealthier, far, far, far better off. I haven't seen a film theater show. I I knew about it, but I never got to start the strip. Uh, I did realize that there's a there was a musical that spun off from it. I don't know if you have heard of the cool? musical. I think I've heard at one point that in- Catch Me If You Can went to Broadway, but I'm not sure if it was like a, a musical per se. I thought it was a musical at one point. It was just in 2011. I didn't read much about it, but. Oh, it is a musical. What the fridge? Uh, apparently, it was nominated for t- uh, four Tony Awards, including Best Musical. Uh-huh. Well, so, if she's actually successful. It got a musical spinoff and all that good shit. But, oh, wow. but like Matt said, if you are interested in what he talked about, the casting, I mean, you got Chris Walken in there. Check it out. Yeah, it's Sound for, like- yeah, it's like... Go see it if you want to see a good performance by Christopher Walken, um, a good duo by Tom Hanks and Leonardo DiCaprio, a good Spielberg film. I mean, like, there are so many reasons why you got to check it out. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Christopher Walken, I have a, I have a thesis about him. He, here is a guy who, who can pretty much do whatever the hell he wants with his career. And I think uh, as we go, as we go on our little journey tonight, we're going to come across a lot of very interesting uh, combinations here. Probably. Um, so, James, what would you like to talk about? What's your poison tonight? What do you want to start off with? Well, let's see here. I'm going to start off with something that's very different from. Uh, Anything like Catch Me If You Can. Here's a little film called The Prophecy. Actually, I should say even more than that. There is, it's not just a little film. It's a whole series of films. I'm glad the franchise you came here. 
Mm-hmm. Christopher Walken has starred in, I believe, the first three films of the franchise. And what is it about? Why is it so great? Well, I would put it I would put these movies along more along the lines of being okay, enjoyable. Um, I've only seen the first one, so I can't really speak to the rest of them. Um, I only had time for one for this podcast. But let's see what it's about. Uh, the whole premise of this is that there is a there is another there is another chapter to the Bible that we don't know about. One that was not included. And uh, that chapter of the Bible details that after the events in the New Testament, a war broke out in heaven between the different angels. And uh, in this case, we have, angel we have angels who strictly want to follow God's will versus angels that want to go back to the way things were before in sort of the pre-Old Testament days where everyone's everyone's power was uh, all the angels were pretty much gods at least that's how they describe it here right. and uh, that's that's what um, that's what this is about the uh, uh, Christopher Walken plays the angel Gabriel uh, who's on the latter side the side that wants to defect against God and uh, pretty much make himself a god as well and uh, you got a, a mix of other of other angels and uh, uh, personalities here that um, that have come to earth and uh, the war that's been raging on in heaven for centuries now for thousands of years even they just decided to re sort of relocate it. So now we're we're in the crossfire. Uh, some folks have said that this is this is kind of the precursor to the film Legion. Uh, with a it was a it was a film that that came out a few years ago, following a very similar premise. Only there, I think it was the it was the after. It was, it was more of an apocalyptic tale. Are you sure you want to connect it with evil ice cream men and demon grandmas? Hmm. I was not the one that made it, that connection. That was the amazing atheist that made that connection years ago. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> I don't want to bring him up, but okay. Okay. So. Yeah, enough said there. Um, the the world that this that this film creates is it's got um, it it's got it it's dealing with uh, with heavenly creatures that um, that we don't that we only know about from uh, from what we've read, and the film comes up with. When, when dealing with fantasy, the a film likes to try to explain things a lot of the time. So they have to come out and explain the anatomy of an angel. And... Uh, no, the angels in this, in this movie do not have wings attached to their back. Oh, really? Not uh -huh. even the fallen ones. Uh, no, in this... In this, um... In this film, it's established that angels, they're, they're not exactly born. And if they are born, they're born into the, into the body that they, into the full-grown body that they have. Um, I say this because early on, there is, there is a fight between several different angels. One of them, one angel gets killed, and he is sort of an 
ugly, dangerous-looking mother. And his body ends up at a morgue where our hero, a guy named Thomas Daggett, is uh, a detective, is, is trying to figure out what's up with all these bodies that, uh, that happen to be showing up lately. Not knowing that there, not knowing that there is an angel war going on, and so he he goes to the morgue in one scene, and he's uh, and he's uh, given he, he's given the the breakdown by the mortician, who's taking a look at this angel's body, and he says, "You know how uh, you know how when when you chop a tree down, you can." look through the center of it and see rings. Bones are kind of the same way with calcium. As you as you're born, you grow older and you get layers of calcium on top on top of layer on top of layer on top of layer. Angels don't have that. So it's kind of like chopping it it's kind of like chopping down a tree and finding no rings underneath. Angels. So is it like is it literally like the cartoons like when you slice a limb off like you see just like this red thing and then like a white circle? Probably. <laughs> uh, probably something like that. You know, it, although if they went by that logic, um, uh, you you probably probably have angels getting their arms cut off and look like a bunch of racks of racks of ham or something <laughs> but uh no but it would be good it's like you it's like you literally slice them into pieces and then like they'll just be standing there and it's like you know what i mean right mhm yeah the um Walken's performance here, like I said, he plays the angel Gabriel. He's defecting against God for for selfish reasons, which of course makes him the bad guy. And he's his way of getting is getting of getting forward. They have he has to get his hands on this on this um, this artifact that will that will give him. Uh, the powers that he used to have as an archangel, and uh, so when he comes down to Earth, he's got he he has the ability to create lackeys out of people, and every time he creates a lackey, he goes around and picks. It, it's kind of sick. He uh, he goes and finds someone who's suicidal or or is just commits suicide, and since they're freshly dead and no longer willing to live for themselves, he brings them back to life and makes them a slave. What? So like he controls the bodies of like recently dead people. Not necessarily. He sort of makes them a promise, saying, "Oh yeah, you commit suicide, but you're not dead yet. I'll let you die. I'll let you die when, uh, when, when you've served your purpose." Oh damn. Ugh. Ooh, that is sick. And it there's actually a pretty good payoff to this to this concept because he does. They they do foot. They do focus on. They do focus on uh, one lackey at a time, because suicidal people are so hard to come by. And uh, at what there's, there's one point where uh, Thomas Daggett has to. Has to shoot, a lackey. Uh, spoiler alert: you can, you can actually kill the lackeys. So. Uh, you just you just have to shoot up the body quite enough. They're like zombies, and uh, so he 
Yeah, he, he kills the lackey, and the lackey's sort of looking at him like, Thank you. Uh-huh. Whoosh. It was a... This is a darkly comical moment in in the film. We also have Vigo Mortensen playing Lucifer. Vigo Mortensen? Oh! Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I was surprised to see that was him. I did not recognize him. Hmm. Yes, uh, Aragorn... As Lucifer. Yeah, really. Wow. But um, the funny thing is here, Lucifer in this in this universe, Lucifer. You think, okay, he's Satan. He's Lucifer. He's the fallen angel. He's not the bad guy here. Ishwat. What? Uh, if. Because if heaven is divided, heaven separates into into different um, the different factions. There will be no need for hell anymore. So if Gabriel wins, uh, he's out of a oh. job. Oh, that was interesting. Huh. So that's that's the premise of this film, and it's very. I, I, I should say it's 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 decent. Um, you know, Walken, Walken basically plays Walken. Uh, <laughs> uh, be being a bad guy, and that's and that's kind of the fun about watching a Christopher Walken role is that even when he's not stretching himself as an actor. He's just sort of enjoying himself in the moment. Uh, he he loses his lackey halfway through, and he's just he's just pissed at the at the good guy. He's like, "Do you know how hard it is to come across one of those?" Mm-hmm. Now, honestly, I have never heard of the. Any, I've never heard anything about the prophecy until today, but I do have to say from the from the description that you gave us, it really does sound like a really interesting concept. It's a risky, con- it's like a really risky one, considering it does touch upon Christianity and stuff like that. But it really does sound like an in- like an interesting idea, having like the angels battling against each other. And like there definitely is, it definitely sounds like there is an idea there. Like, um, I, I don't want to be that guy who would give Hollywood ideas, but I can imagine this like having a re, like having a remake, like seeing like what another produce, like another mm-hmm. director can do with this ideology. Um, as for Christopher Walken, if it is just Walken being Walken, the first the first time I heard that Christopher Walken is playing the angel Gabriel in this. Like, I just had this weird image of what if he if he's also the same angel Gabriel, like, if it's the same walking Gabriel, like, in the nativity story. It's like he just comes in, Mary, I just want to tell you that you're pregnant. I know you didn't have sex, but I'm just saying, the baby in you is from God. I just jumped your bones. You're welcome. Merry Christmas. Oh, God. And there's going to be this special holiday on the 25th. Um, we're thinking of calling it Christmas or something like that. You'll figure that out. Um, you're going to have a baby. And on that day, it'll be from the Son of God. Oh, and one more thing, Mary. Don't tell Joseph. Until the moment when it's really obvious. That's funny. Uh, that's that. That's actually pretty good. You got you got the story down. Um, I completely forgot what I was gonna say. Now. Oh yeah, I I recall now. 
Um, as more evidence that Christopher Walken can do whatever he wants with his career, the sequels, Prophecy, Prophecy 2 and 3, he was in, like Mike said, and those went direct to video. Right, and he started in those other and he sequels. Those. Yeah, so I just want to mention also that it's a franchise, so ten years ago there's been two other Prophecy films not starring Christopher Walken. Uh, the Prophecy Uprising and The Prophecy Forsaken. Yeah, they um, do those even have somebody playing Gabriel. That'd be a... No, it's it follows a different character in the film. Yeah, that was one thing I was I was confused about. Why call it the Prophecy? Like it, they, I don't think there's actually a specified prophecy in the film. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just saying okay. There's this angel war going on that we didn't know about, and there's another chapter of the Bible that people aren't supposed to have. Huh. So that does make you think. It's like, why is that titled? Yeah. Uh, what? So what is this? What would be the the? What would be the better title? The Bloody Testament. Um, I don't know. It sounds kind of interesting. In a mm -hmm. nutshell, I haven't seen it either, so... Um, but, you know... Uh, something similar to that, I'm going to go with... Uh, we're going to go into the, the dead zone here, people. Uh, mm -hmm. Highway to the dead zone! Holy crap, this is an early walk-in. In 1983, to be exact. One of the earliest I went to see. Um, this was him just getting off of uh, the Broadway dance troupe and hopping into this film. Yeah, it's like this is his early career, like before you. It's before walking became walking, most likely. But there's some other highlights in the film that are worth talking about. Uh, the Dead Zone, or as people would call it, Stephen King's The Dead Zone, is a book adaptation film based upon Stephen King's The Dead Zone, directed by David Cronenberg, who is a fellow Canadian director that we talked about before in the past. Um, um, the Dead did? Zone. Yeah. Oh, we might have, actually. Yeah. Way over your head. We definitely mentioned him during our Canadian Films episode. We did? Oh, there it is. <laughs> oh, 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 okay, yeah, there it is. It's gone before you can grab it. Dwarf. <laughs> so, of course, it's a Stephen King kind of thing going. It's it's a very simple Stephen King story. It's about John Smith, Johnny Smith, played by Christopher Walken. He's a teacher. He is in love with somebody. Gets into an accident. And then he's in a coma for five years. Wakes up, he's got these supernatural psychic powers, where he can Ooh. touch, where he can touch somebody's hand, and he can see what happens in the future, to, in that person's life. Oh, uh, this sounds familiar. Or in the past, or in the present. It's mostly in the future, based upon what I've seen. Something from maybe the present, but not in the past. Oh, maybe it is a p past. There was one. There was one moment where he took somebody's hand and he looked in the past. Okay, mm -hmm. you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. We want to think about that. So, basically, he's uh, you know, he become, becomes like this phenomenon where people are like, "You gotta help us! You gotta help us! Can you predict the future? Can you help us?" And he tries to have a normal life. <clears throat> he goes back into teaching. You know, little incidents happen here or there. Like, for example, when he first knows about his power, he touches the nurse's hand, and he sees her house being on fire, and you see her daughter in the same room, be, you know, flames are burning, and there's, there's kind of a weird moment where you see Christopher walk in, like a surreal moment where he's seeing the, what's happening, but he's actually in the room at the same time. So there's one moment where the house is on fire. He's like laying in bed, like, 
Get out of here, little girl. Get out of here. And then he turns around, and suddenly he's back with the nurse. He says, "Yeah, yeah." It's the like daughter is screaming. Yeah, the daughter. The, do the house is on fire. The house is on fire. Daughter's screaming. Gotta go. Go. Somehow you turn Minnesotan there. I don't know why. It's like, like the house is on fire now. You gotta go. You gotta go now. <laughs> the wall. The roof is burning. You just gotta go down, boy. How do you? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I've, I've only gotten part way through the film. Yeah, uh, dude. James already talked about it briefly. Like, he saw it mostly because there's one scene where um, the sheriff comes in and talks to him. And he wants to help. He wants his help to find the killer of these mass murders. And the sh Shut up, Chewy. <laughs> Shut up, Chewy. Did you bring in a Wookiee in your room or something? He's my roommate. Ah. Uh, he's uh, he interrupts me once in a while when I do something stupid or being too loud. Um. So, Sheriff is like. Mommy, mommy. Hmm? Oh, he cleared his throat. I see. <laughs> So about the dead zone? The sheriff asks, uh, oh, sheriff says about, you, you are blessed with this gift. And, of course, this is the iconic scene in the movie where I'm walking outbursts and says, God gave me, God blessed me with this. I've been blessed with some 18-wheeler hitting me and again this gift. It was just very outburst and dramatic. It was like, Whoa! Like the, the girl that I that I love belongs to somebody else. Yeah, God's been real keen on me. Exactly. Well, after all, he was the. That's what he gets for defecting against God, you know. Curse <laughs> <Angel> Gabriel. <laughs> right. Well, this that's, came out before, so it's like a revenge. Yeah, it's a kind of revenge. Um. Mm -hmm. There's. But beyond that. After he finds out who the killer is, it goes into like a into a normal thing where Christopher Walken moves away from the town he was in, has his own little place, um, he's tutoring kids now, and he gets asked to tutor this kid, and he touches the kid's hand, and of course another iconic scene later on he notices that they're gonna play hockey, and the kids gonna go fall through the ice, and he says I'm gonna go take a ride with you back to your house to see your dad and. They're talking to his dad, and Watkins like breaks his vase. And he's like, "The ice is gonna break." <laughs> Best part of the movie where he says, "The ice is gonna break." The ice, the ice is gonna break. <laughs> and they actually listen to him, and the kid's still alive. So he's like, "Okay, I can predict the future, and I can prevent it." So, of course, there's little things in the background you might notice in the film where um oh, I can't think of his name Martin Sheen is in this film he plays a politician who's running for U United States Senate and Walken touches Sheen's hand at one point and he, he predicts the future where he's a corrupt man he wants the president to you know Signed for this deal to sh shoot missiles into a country, like like warfare. So, Walken's like, you know, I can save people's lives. So he ends up trying to kill him at the end. Spoiler alert, um, but misses, and he end up, he ends up dying at the end because he got shot at for shooting at Martin Sheen at the end of the film. So he dies. And in the film, it's just with Walken's performance in the film. He does it. It's very emotional. Like he's got this problem where, or this gift, and he just just wants to live a normal life, you know. Of course, he's been in a coma for five years. Oh, his sweetheart got married with another guy and had a kid. Oh shit! What are we gonna do now? You know, he's all pissed in his life. He's like, why? Why me? All of a sudden, there's like I said, there's a couple of outbursts here and there, which are kind of nice in the film, which 
you can repeat over and over. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's uh, it makes me want to read the book actually to see, because I've been reading reviews of it and the people are saying it's the best Stephen King adaptation. So I was like, okay, if it's living up to that hype, I might as well just read the book and compare. There is a spin-off TV series that's loosely based on the book, also called The Dead Zone, starring Anthony Michael Hall as Johnny Smith. I did see that as well. I have not seen the show, so I have no, no idea what it comparisons, but if you like Stephen King adaptation films, and you like Christopher Walken in early role, and you want to actually see the scene where he says, the ice is going to break, you can actually just give it a watch sometime. Yeah, if I can be very honest, this is actually, like, I haven't fully heard about Dead Zone, but everything about it, from the ice is gonna break, and, like, the concept of the story and stuff like that, um, so suddenly it did click on me. The, like, the con, like, the storyline of, uh, the responsibility of having psychic powers and stuff like that, it has been parodied before, so, it, um, it definitely is... Um, a more memorable story of, um, of of Stephen King's. So, it, it maybe it's not uh, immediately iconic as something like It or Cujo or The Shining or stuff like that. Right. But the plot line does have a sense of familiarity, and it has been used a lot. So, like, that's a, that's the most that I could say with the Dead Zone, since like I do remember a bit of it. So I do like. The, there, there definitely is a sense of like, oh, I've heard of this. Mm -hmm. Indeed yeah, so. the, I, I still have to to finish watching it, but I, I do remember in the in the TV series, things uh, that it does sound like um, from Mike's full explanation there that a lot of things did carry over even there I mean the the whole thing about the the kid who's you said a hockey player yeah yeah there's one kid who wants to play hockey with his friends and he gets false for the ice there's a whole there's a whole episode that was dedicated to that uh, only he was instead of falling through the ice he was trying to stop the kid from having a having a heart attack on the on the playing on the field Huh. His heart is gonna break. <sighs> and there's another episode where he did, where he helps a sheriff track down a killer. And then there was another episode where he gets caught up in a bank robbery, but um, I that I don't think that was in the book or the film. So, so it's loosely based on the book. So yeah. they had to kind of stretch it out to see you. Mm hmm Make a buck or two. They got to make do stuff to make it more interesting. Yeah, I mean that's actually kind of interesting having this psychic telling the future kind of detective helping out people, which they did for a good chunk of the film. Mm hmm didn't he say at one point, he, he, every time he uses his power, he feels like he's dying a little bit inside? Yeah, and that's... I think that's what he referred to as the dead zone. That's where the name drops in, like, every time he touches somebody and proceeds past or future, he has, like, a little dead... He's, like, dying, and he's putting it into the dead zone or something. Hmm... Yeah, I thought I thought that the that the term dead zone was supposed to. I, I guess I sort of assumed that the term dead zone was referring to part of the brain that's uh, that he hadn't used yet that's now being activated. I could be too. I that scene I wasn't really particular. Like I kind of losing focus during that point. Or there's the point it goes up and down because walking in the film. With, kind of serious in his acting, like, there wasn't, he was, like, trying to be this emotional kind of character, like, you know, at heart. It's just, I was like, okay, straightforward walk and nothing outbursty. When I think of walk and I think of the outburst acting, 
Like, I kind of compare it to, like, another actor, like, Nicolas Cage. Like, Nicolas Cage is known for his outburst acting. Walking's, like, the same way. You know him for his outburst lines and just, like, flamboyant acting, in a way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, well, this is his more earlier works. This is it. In, is it is it is this, this is one in of the one earlier. where he, like he broke he broke the mold and like we yeah. recognize him as the, the modern walking, walking. as we know right, him. right, exactly. Of course, I chose films that I probably didn't have that modern walking. I probably chose the films that didn't have an earlier walking where he's trying to fit into the mold of it all. Becoming who he was. Mm hmm. I mean, he hasn't. He rarely turns it out a part. He takes any part because uh, he's under the belief that making movies, whether they turn out good or bad, is always a rewarding experience for him. Oh, so that explains. Uh, that explains how, how he signed on for Joe Dirt 2. Oh, yeah. Oh my um, god, he did, didn't he? Oh god, yes, well, he, he had, did. He had, he had to reprise his role somehow. Yeah, hey, uh, not, I'm not saying anything about, you know, Joe Dirt was a bad movie or anything. No, it was, actually, that actually was on today, so I could have watched that. <laughs> oh. But did you know, fun fact, did you know that George Lucas' second choice for Han Solo was Christopher Walken? For the prequel? For the... For New Hope. For the original? Yep, 1977. Wouldn't New he Hope. be a little too young for that? No idea. <laughs> Could you imagine Christopher Walken as Han Solo? He mm-hmm. has a... He has a phobia on uh, going too fast in cars. And this is actually a pretty cool fact. He worked briefly as a lion tamer in a circus at age 15. But from no, one maybe. film to another film, actually not even a film actually, this is <laughs> actually a television special on NBC yep. technically, but it counts. And it's interesting to under to know about this more because I've heard about it and I knew about it. Never fully watched it from front to back, but I knew about Christopher Walken as Captain Hook in Peter Pan Live. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, what this an is... experiment. <laughs> oh my god, yes. Where you, Mike, you said that um, in the Dead Zone, Christopher Walken is not really the Christopher Walken that we know in there. This is the opposite. This is so much the opposite. I know. Okay, now... I know right now I am going to say that my opinions are going to be quite controversial, uh, considering, well, you'll see, you'll see coming up. Okay, but anyways, wow! (laughs) Now, as you may recently know, uh, NBC is starting to do these live shows again, starting with the disaster that was The Sound of Music. I did not see that, and I think I'm glad that I skipped it. But I did decide to check this one out, and... Wow! I mean, wow! It was just pure madness. Where do I even begin? Honestly, okay, here's where the controversial part begins. I understand many of the traditions that it tries to keep with with the Peter Pan, like the original show of Peter Pan, but never have I felt more appreciative to the ninth, to the, um... to the 1953 Disney animated feature to it, where it broke some uh, traditions for a reason. Number one, good God, the acting. (laughs) The acting was pretty bad in there, and, like, often it goes all over the place. Um, The first one I would have to say is with Peter Pan... Peter Pan herself, played by uh, Allison Williams. And this is usually the tradition... I understand, like, why they would have her. It is the tradition of having a girl with eight cups to play Peter Pan and stuff. But honestly, like, it's not really... She's not really passed on 
as a boy. Like, you can still see it's a girl. Like, we still see moments with um, her with her and Wendy. It's like, like, well, can you give me a, pit, a kiss, Peter? I'm sure you can hear, like, a few television sets going, yeah! <laughs> Uh, man, <laughs> these are the moments I'm actually glad Jada's not here. <laughs> yeah. um, no, we love you, Jada. But anyways, um, that's another one. Like, yeah, may, like, uh, yeah, it's like not really huge on that. Also, oh my God, the Lost Boys were they such a major highlight? They were like, if you took the revolutionary boys of Les Miserables and you all give them, like, and they all suddenly become brain dead. That's essentially how they become. Oh my god, it was, it's just, they just become so idiotic. And like, they're no longer boys. They're practically men now. It's really kind of dumb. Uh, And then the sets... Now, yes, this is a live show, but oh my god, I've seen mm. plenty... That's not really an excuse. I've seen plenty of live shows that look much better than this. I've seen local play productions that look better than this. Everything looks like it came out of a freaking Dr. Seuss book. <laughs> Yikes. And, um, what else can I say? Like a lot, it since this is like three hours long, it really feels way too long. It feels much longer than it should. Actually, there are probably a lot of useless song. Like a lot of these songs are pretty useless, and like they really do drag. Like it really does feel dragged on. That's probably the best way to put it. Is that a lot of the songs are just dragged on. But I will say another thing is that there are even some traditions that they broke. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess now is the time that we can finally get into the reason why I want to talk about this is because of Christopher Walken as Captain Hook. Now, if I can be honest, the only reason why I wanted to see this in the first place is to see Captain is to see Christopher Walken as Captain Hook. And it's exactly what I got. I saw Christopher Walken as Captain Hook. And I'm actually dead serious here. Like, Christopher Walken is the only reason why anybody would watch this. Because he did not play Captain Hook. He he is not going to replace the Disney Hook whatsoever. He, or like, wait, who played uh, Captain Hook in that one? Like, he's pretty much the the definitive Captain Hook nowadays. Yeah, Yeah, Hans Humphrey. Hans oh, Conrad. Con- Hans, Hans Conrad. Conrad. Like, he's pretty much the point of the book. This, Christopher Walken is not Captain Hook. Christopher Walken is Christopher Walken in this. And there are definitely a lot of moments where it's so obvious where he flubbed up his lines. Like, he just winged it most of the time. Like, there was even a moment, like, after, like, what was supposed to be the touching song between Wendy and the Lost Boys, like... He stood there for an entire minute just going, Peter Pan lost his mother. Peter Pan lost his mother. (laughs) And that's it. Like, that's... And, like, I'm looking at the posters right now. Like, you see, like, like, uh, Christopher Walken entirely spruced up as, um, Captain Hook, like, with the long mustache and and the brown, and the black... Like the black hair and stuff like that, like all prepped up, but he doesn't even look like that in the original show. Like my god, like he just looks like a hollow, like a half-assed Halloween costume of uh, Jack Sparrow. Like it's oh. sad. Here's a fun fact: he was considered for that role. Wait, what? Jack Sparrow. Jack yep. Sparrow. Yep. That's true. I also heard Robin Williams and well, no, well Steven Spielberg thought that Robin Williams or Steve Martin would be a perfect role for Jack Sparrow, actually. But that's the thing, though. It's like, that's pretty much the only reason why you would ever watch this, is because um... Mm -hmm. Oh, and that's another... Speaking of which, that's that's the tradition that actually broke. Now, in the the shows and stuff like that, um, uh, it's always 
the uh, the father of the darlings is supposed to be the one that should play uh, Captain Hook. In this case, it's not. Uh, apparently, it's the guy who played Mr. Smee in yes. the live show that plays Darling. But let's be honest, I think we can all understand why. Now, I know, like, like it may seem weird, but let, let's be fair. I mean, we can tell if it's walking. We can tell if it's like, now, kids, you need to bring Nana out. She's being a bad dog. Right now, they need to learn to grow up. And then just five minutes later, I am the dubious evil Captain's book. I need to go and take down the pan. And my god, it's just... I think... I think it's because of Christopher Walken that it makes it such a fabulous mess. Yeah, funny, he... Outside of that... It, I would have felt like I've wasted my time completely, but because of Christopher Walken, I feel satisfied because I wanted to see this to see Christopher Walken as Captain Hook, and that's exactly what I got. Christopher Walken as Captain Hook. Yeah, see, the what they're doing here, what, they, what they've been doing with that is sort of a, is a continuation of a, a long time TV tradition, which which is uh, you know televised plays. Right. That's uh, that's what they did with the stingiest man in town back in the fifties. Right. Um. So. Uh, to to see that, to see that there is a network out there that's wanting to do this sort of thing, to. To risk. To risk putting on a live play in front of cameras for mm-hmm. everyone to see and to risk having actors and techies screw up mm-hmm. and not have it and not have it uh, be fixable that's, uh, sorry that's to the, interrupt, but the I... charm that this that's the charm that this had Go on. Yeah, that's another thing I, I just realized. Uh, speaking of the actors, one thing I forgot to mention about them is that they definitely hired them for their singing and dancing abilities. Mm-hmm. It never crossed their mind about acting. Um, a great example is some some of the kids, even. The kid who played Michael. Oh, my God. I understood absolutely nothing from that kid. Every word he says is like a mumble. Did you, he barely had any lines too. He's and when he speaks, he's not even he's not even trying to act. He's being well, he's being a five year old. But it's still. So, uh, so I wanted to mention this uh, since Matt did mention how Allison Williams played Peter Pan. You know why females play Peter Pan? Well, for their it's more mostly for the girl. Yeah, it's mostly. They're more adult as performers, but like they can they can also easily pass off as boys. It's kind of the tradition, like it's it's like in voice acting when they would hire girls, uh, to, right? Like, to do gruffy voices and stuff like that. But this is a different case where the uh, da, 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 where was I reading? The creator of Peter Pan, J. M. Bar- Bari, first wrote the story as a play, and for the f- first production, nineteen. 19- Oh four, uh, Peter was played by actress. Um, so the reason why it was an actress because this first started because the English labor laws stipulating that children actors couldn't work on stage after nine p.m. So for practical reasons, a grown woman played Peter Pan instead of a young boy. Ah, uh, mm. that okay. So it's more for practical reasons. I understand, but still, like. I mean, traditions had to had to break somehow. This is why uh, I think Disney is actually the first one to break uh, to break this uh, tradition when they brought in crap. What's the boy's name? Hold on a sec. But I know they're the first one to. Br- I think that yeah, Bo- Bobby Driscoll to play as Peter Pan. Right. Just mm. a, just a little uh, factoid for you, in case you're curious about the tradition of the actress playing Peter Pan. 
Okay, well, if it's a technical reason, that's definitely interesting. But still, I mean, this is a tele... Like, for this, this is a televised play. They can make an exception. Well, I'm sure they could have gotten at least, like, one of the Lost Boys and actually make him an actor instead of, like, <laughs> dumbing him down just for the form, just to be a part of the Lost Boys, looking like a goofball going, We have a mother! Alas, we have a mother! Uh, oh god! Uh, you know what the the the, the biggest mind freak of this whole, of that whole performance was the the Indians. Name oh reckon? yes, that one. Yes, uh, I say this for two reasons. One, uh, when when they first showed up, I heard I, that guy. Oh my god, that's true. They look like they were naked. Yes, that's what I. Oh my God, yes. I'm looking at one of the guys here, and I'm I'm thinking, is that a sock? <laughs> is that a sock? <laughs> is that a sock? Are you happy to see me? No, I remember. Like all the Indians are like these like, buffy hot men. Like, like they're pretty much rejects of werewolves from Twilight. <laughs> like, all hot bodies and stuff like that, and then they just have Tiger Lily, who's pretty much the most dressed and stuff like that. It's like... It makes no sense. And, and the oh, other thing... The other like, thing... This is sort of a nitpick here. Um, uh, one of the... They they change the, the lyrics to one of the songs. Uh, the Indians have a friendship song... Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, I forget what it's called. I was like, um, ah, wah, 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 wah. I, there's just one thing to do. I will send for Tiger, Tiger Lily. I'll send for Peter Pan. I, yeah. I used to watch the Mary Martin recording when I was a kid, and uh, they always, st they always uh, started out with this lyric. Along, well, they also started off with uh, Peter Pan smoking you know, a a bubble peace pipe, but um, typically the the first line that the song comes up with is "Ago, ago, 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 wow," and why do they say "agawag"? Because they don't know how Native Americans actually speak, so it's just sort of whatever they heard on television. Mm -hmm. And so for the I'm watching this play, and and there's the lyric is changed to oh hey oh hey oh hey oh hey wow I was like huh hmm. <laughs> from what I've actually heard though um Uggawug is just a random it's just random jarble from stupid white people not knowing what Indian words mean exactly uh, Ingawa uh, the the new version though is an actual like native uh, word for like friendship for it, it stands for something but I know it's a real like, it's a real word. Like, it's more authentic to say. Right. Yeah. And so it threw me off guard at, at, at first, to say the least. And I was, I, you know, I had to, I had to have it explained to me by Morgan. Uh, and uh, who, who I was, who I was, who I was texting, actually, with while we were watching the play. <laughs> Uh, there was, I remember the part where they, uh, where you have to, they prompted the audience to clap for Tinkerbell. Oh, yeah. Oh, And oh, do you remember this? you remember what happened here? They, there was a, there was a line of text that popped up at the bottom saying, uh, tweet hashtag save Tinkerbell, uh, to, to your Twitter right now. Wait, oh my god, that's true. <laughs> it did have that. That's <laughs> that's how kids are Yeah, that's how kids are gonna save uh, are gonna save Tinkerbell. It's like, well on mom, we gotta save Tinkerbell. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag believe in fairies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh and, and so I'm I'm texting Morgan and I texted him. Hashtag save Tinkerbell. And he's on the other end. He's watching with his boyfriend. And he, uh, 
he texts me back, says, uh, uh, I, he says, uh, Drago didn't do shit. <laughs> <laughs> and oh. so I texted him back, I said, hashtag, Dra Drago didn't do shit. <laughs> Take, so that's uh, back. No thanks to you, Draco. <laughs> Morgan, if you're, we know you're probably listening to this. We, we hope you're laughing with us. It was a great, it was a great fun time. Oh my god! But James, you just remind me of another aspect, and like this is the one that like that's another like major disaster area. Oh my god! The special effects. <laughs> How okay. Bad special effects. Well, Tinkerbell was CGI, wasn't she? Yeah, Tinkerbell she was... was. Tinkerbell was played by uh, a mouse cursor, I believe. Yeah. Because I, uh, I, I was reading like trivia where Tinkerbell was always played by a spotlight, but this one they made her CGI. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like CGI, and then they got light up effects and stuff like that. It is, it's like one of the saddest things, like. Um, if you want a good example of a recent Tinkerbell, go on YouTube and check, um, like, the queue area for Peter Pan's flight. They recently updated, and oh my god, it looks fantastic. This is how you do Tinkerbell. Like, it is, like, it's, it's just incredible. This, on the other hand, holy crap, I think even I can do a much better job than that. <laughs> Oh my, and I think like other than the Christopher Walken Walker, wa other than the Christopher Walken moments, I think I've never laughed so hard at it when I saw like the flying scene when they had to get out of the, when they had to leave the uh, like the house to go and to go and fly to Neverland, like when they're it's so blatantly obvious how they got their like hooks on and they're flying. It's just oh my god. It was so dumb. Oh my god, and another thing. Mm -hmm. The spots. Oh, another thing, please. Another thing. Just saying, <laughs> spotlights can easily ruin everything. Because when you first see Peter Pan, like, when he's trying to talk about, like, getting his shadow and all that stuff, like, <laughs> like I'm just there, it's like, it's like, I need to go and find my shadow. Have you seen it? Yeah, it's, it, it's there. It's right there. It's like right under your feet. It's a little faint, but it's right there. It's, it's, it's over there. Oh yeah. There uh, again. That's. It's such a disaster piece. Oh my god! It's. That's pretty much the only reason why anybody would watch it is to see Christopher Walken as Captain Hook. That's it. What about the time? Uh... That they were doing some sort of teacup dance with the Lost Boys at one point, balancing teacups on their head. Oh, I think. Oh, yeah. And uh, playing patty cake or something. And I, just before the commercial, just before the commercial break, a saucer falls off Peter Pan's head, and he's like, uh, puts it back on. <laughs> I I don't think I remember that much. She she was such a she was such a trooper. She oh yeah. Oh, Allison Williams is such a trooper. I know. Yeah. I mean, one, one effect that I thought was cool. Um, the, the shot, uh, the uh, the the digital shadows during the shadow song. Uh, they oh, yeah. they had, they had two of them sort of reflected on either sides of the room, and they were huge and dancing, and yeah. it looked like it must have been pre-rendered. Digitally, but um, yeah, yeah. I mean, they were trying their best, you know, with what they really had and what they were doing. I mean, NBC's taking a lot of risks. I guess this one of the better effects, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Well, hopefully NBC does a lot more and they gain experience from each play they do, you know, and they can get better from here. And yeah. you know, Christopher Walken is Captain Hook. I mean, you might as well just go check it out. I mean. This is like his most recent thing he has done, and so if you want to see walking just for walking, go ahead. It's it's cheesy popcorn for you. It's cheesy. It's the reason why live TV shows they just don't work. <laughs> like they just well, I'm not saying they don't work in general. It's just 
should be handled much better than it is now. There you go. There we go. Let's talk about a animated feature that I'm surprised that Matt has not talked about yet, but James will talk about instead. In my defense, like, I was checking the list, and, like, like since there was so much and stuff like that, like, I, honestly, it kind of shocked <laughs> me that I glanced over the, uh, this one, to be honest, but I'll explain later. James, you go on with it. Well, that's... I can't really blame you for that, because... Uh, this was at a, a certain time in DreamWorks animation, or DreamWorks, I should say DreamWorks, period, where they were focused on seeing how many, diff how many different big-name uh, stars they could fit on one marquee. No, this is, the tra this is the beginning... No, that is the beginning of the tradition for DreamWorks. They're still doing it today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about... Ants. If you look at some of, if you look at some of uh, their, if you look at some of Dreamworks more recent uh, picks like How to Train Your Dragon, and whatnot, I don't think I would be able to name as many people as I would here. We have Woody Allen, Aunt Dan Aykroyd, Anne Bancroft, Jane Curtin, Danny Glover, Gene Hackman, Jennifer Lopez, Sylvester Stallone, Sharon Stone. Christopher, and of course Christopher Walken. That's a lot of star power. I'm no kidding. The plot here is Woody Allen as a as a lonely neurotic worker ant wants to do something different with his life. Uh, decides to go ahead and play soldier and imitate a soldier so that he can get closer to the princess um, Princess Bala played by Sharon Stone and this lands him in a whirlwind of trouble when they get when they get uh, kicked out when they get accidentally kicked out of the ant hill together and they're on a journey to some place called Insectopia which he's heard of but hasn't actually seen it's some sort of paradise for insects. I see okay. 17 minutes and 45 seconds. Make it quick. Now, in this movie, J uh, Christopher Walken plays uh, a colonel. Uh, the le our lead villain here is Gene Hackman, uh, who plays General, General Mandible, an army, army ant that wants to... Uh, take over the ant hill, and his lackey, Colonel Cutter, played by Christopher Walken. Uh, Christopher Walken is the only ant in the movie with wings. Kind of a kind of, kind of an odd choice. What? Yes. But it's the lucky one has the wings. Yeah, you know how you look at other movies and you see, like, the. Uh, you look at other movies like A Bug's Life and it's only the, the queen ant that has wings or what have you. Oh my god. It, it It's uh, typically a role that's given to a female. Well, I believe, uh, biologically speaking, the female ants only do have wings. So, but um, Christopher Walken is a is a male ant with wings. So let's just go with it. Yeah, just just go with it. No, don't question it. And here's kind of, here's where actually some folks did have an issue. I remember talking with people because this movie this movie was out when I was in high school. It was competing the the same year with Bugs Life, and we all know that story. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, get, I'll get into more details on it. Um, some people were complaining that Christopher Walken was playing a guy who's not a bad guy, and I guess the I guess the stigma here is that at this point in his career, Christopher Walken had sort of been 
much. I thought he'd, he, he'd been in a lot of different bad guy roles or playing roles where he's uh, an anti-hero, like in King of New York, something of that nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, View to a Kill, he plays a, he plays a Bond villain, so there you go. Right, right. Um, it, it threw some folks off that he was playing a guy who's not a bad guy, but, spoiler alert, a, a, a trickster, a trickster bad guy. A turncoat. And, uh, I, I, I didn't really see a problem with that myself, I just, I looked at this film and it, it, it kind of has... It, it kind of has an almost unfinished look to the animation, I think. But um, it, it's still a solid film. And all I'm just looking at are all, all these names. Good God. DreamWorks, why did you have to do this? <laughs> okay. Matt, go on. All right. So I think, as James has mentioned, the big, uh, the big, the big elephant in the room when it comes to ants is pretty much the big battle between... Uh, ants versus a bug's life. Now there have been stories regarding like how Jeffrey Katzenberg might have ripped off ants when he quit Disney and moved on to making DreamWorks. Like he knew about John Lasseter and the crew's idea about making uh, a bug's life, so he decided to make his his own movie. So that really that pretty much ignited the big wall, the big battle between Disney versus DreamWorks uh, in terms of animation. But honestly, like at the end of the day, I think, uh, like, but um, a bug's life pretty much won the battle, and I can imagine why. Because number one, uh, a bug's life definitely looks much more appealing than a bug's life. Uh, no, a bug's life look, looks much more appealing than ants, uh, mostly because, for one, it's colorful and the designs are much more appealing. Like they look more friendly, they look more colorful. There are definitely a lot of other bugs, so it's much more creative in that department. In uh, ants, however, like all the ants, they're pretty much they're they're still in that they all have that monotone reddish brown color. It's just like they try to have a bit of that realistic look to them. It's just it just looks kind of weird for the most part. And like just they the look like aliens. Look, yeah, a bit. <laughs> That's, that's the thing. They don't look as appealing. So, like, and plus of Disney's amazing marketing team, like, we know that A Bug's Life kind of won the battle. But uh, Ant still definitely is a milestone when it comes uh, for DreamWorks. For one, it is their first movie ever. And I think this is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but this could be also the first uh, computer animated feature that's not from Pixar, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I could be wrong, but um, it is like it is pretty close in between. Like this, pretty much did started the whole big thing of like DreamWorks Animation and like what will eventually lead on to like animation as it is today. But at the end of the day, like like we, we mostly remember Ants because of the battle of what it had with a bug's life. If it weren't for that, then like this would have been practically obscure, probably as much as Spirit Stallion of Cimarron and Sinbad. Oh, well. Those... Uh, I, I did see Spirit. That was kind of forgettable. Yeah. But uh, it, Ants was also part of the whole DreamWorks argument of, uh, yeah, we have to do away with hand-drawn animation because this movie was a success. No, not really. No, 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 no. It's, um, no, like I said, this is their first movie ever. Like, a few months afterwards, they would release, uh, uh, The Prince of Egypt, and that was a hit. Um, it was, it wasn't until Shrek when they realized computer animation is a major, major thing, and then, like, Spirit and Sinbad was released, and they decided to give up on hand-drawn animation altogether. Well, uh, close enough. Yeah. And that was, uh, that was... That was during the time Disney was thinking about doing the same thing too, and uh, and then goodbye, Michael Eisner. Yep, <laughs> that's a, home on the range. Like one moment they see home on the range, and then Chicken Little, GTFO Eisner, Bob, come clean up this mess. 
<laughs> oh man. Bob Iger still running? Or yeah, he's still yeah he like he has he has signed on for a while. I think for now it's up till 2018 or something like that. Hmm. Okay. Goody. Haven't he's seen... doing he's doing good for now. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's doing good. He, he's doing good. He hasn't reached his major down point yet, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll see. Like, once Star Wars will come, like we'll wait a little after Star Wars will be released, and we'll see how he goes. Well, let's see, uh, Marvel, and you know, here we go. No, he definitely did a lot of fantastic stuff. No one oh yeah. It. Oh yeah, he's he's made a lot of good business decisions, I think. Oh yeah, oh, yeah definitely, definitely. So, yeah, ants. Um, for what it was worth, I think is is kind of uh, a decent film, but I, I don't I haven't seen either that or Bugs Life a lot in a long time, so I don't know which one to to put on top of the other. For now, I would go with A Bug's Life. It's just the more enjoyable film. It's the more likable film. Like, with Ants, uh, it, it's it's not as appealing, like, at first. It's been a while since I've seen Ants as well, but still, like, give me Bug's Life any day of the week. You know, it's time to talk about the last feature of the night. Mm-hmm. And I might have to pause the timer at one point to actually talk about it because I got eight minutes and thirty seconds left at least. Great unless Scott. You, unless you know how to do it quick. Quickie Mickey Nicky Dicky 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 Yeah I don't know. Alright. Yeah what he said. King of New York Christopher Walken plays some kind of an anti hero. As James kind of mentioned briefly when discussing about his characters. Um, for me, this. It, honestly, King of New York is basically about Frank White, played by Christopher Walken, who got released from prison and basically, basically, in a nutshell, is a remake of Scarface, where he has to climb the ladder back up to become the king of New York. More or less. That's how I thought of it, like, because they, in IMDb, they said it was a, like a moderate retelling of Robin Hood, because I think at one point in the film where he's trying to set up this hospital in this ghetto neighborhood of New, um, New York, and he, he kills people to climb up, and it's, it, it's, a, it's a mess of a story. Like, I couldn't understand the story for the longest time as I'm watching it, but his character is Frank White. He, he's, he does it very seriously. Like, there there isn't points where he's being walking. There's, like, one point where he's being walking where he tries to incorporate dance. He kind of does that in every film he does. Try to put a little dance in, in all his films. So there's one point in the film. You got also got Loris Fishburne in it. You got uh, uh, Wesley Snipes in there. And then you got David Caruso in there as well in between. I guess Steve Cowboy Cruz. Curtis hit on hard times. Yeah, yeah, because because uh, you got you got Lawrence Fishburne, uh, he's like accomplice to Frank White's uh, walking, and at the, the beginning scene you see you see him with um, Steve Buscemi checking out cocaine, and he's like, "Oh, that's good stuff." Some mm -hmm. cocaine and waffles. Um, I thought Fishburne... those were just sugar sprinkles. <laughs> Anywho, Loris, I, I don't get a lot of walking because he's just he's just straight up so cold in this. He's like a badass in this film. Like he kills every like not everybody, but a lot of people in this film. Like the death count is like amazing. Um, like Loris Fishburne is hamming it up. You got Wesley Snipes and David Caruso trying to catch Frank White because they're cops and then you know they are just walking there's one point in the film where he meets everybody for the first time after being released from prison he goes bop 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 whoa pow 
just dancing, having a good time. And I was like, okay, I want more of that. Where's more of that? But no. He just he's just like, I'm gonna climb to the top. I'm gonna be the ultimate guy. I want that hospital in this in this neighborhood. I'm gonna be the king of New York. I'm gonna run for mayor. That's what I'm gonna do. Oh my gosh, he said the title of the movie. <laughs> it just it's just one of those and the thing is this film when it first came out was people saw it and a lot of people left during the screening like even the director's wife did as well and they, he did a QA afterwards and people were like why'd you make this film it's abomination it sucks uh, that's coming down on it a little bit harsh I think and then really. <laughs> an, uh, another screening Lars Fishburne another actor was there and they were just booed out of the screening just because people love, hated it so bad it's not a great movie it's okay film. Like, if you want to see Christopher Walken be this badass killing people. I mean, there's one shot in the film where uh, David Cruz's partner, Wesley Snipes, dies. Spoiler alert. And Cruz is, like, all sad. He's like, ah, oh, son of a bitch, why would this car start? And then Walken drives by. Bang. Head explodes. Like, whoa, Jesus, you killed David Caruso. <laughs> Does he the star of the film? No, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> We're just like, okay, a lot of killer shots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it. I only saw it once. It was, uh, it was pretty, in, it was pretty enjoyable. Uh, so I can't say, I, I can't say everything that I remember. Um, I will say, one. One story that I do remember about watching it. Now this, uh, this is just sort of uh, a fun little note. Um, when uh, I was watching it, and the the scene where you mentioned uh, walking, meeting up with the guys first time as he's coming out of jail and they're doing cocaine, uh, yeah, and he's got that line where he's like, "I want." I want in on all the drug profits, you know. Uh, on the co- if it's cocaine, if it's if it's heroin, I want in. And uh, just as the scene is winding down, there's there's one shot where somebody says something to Christopher Walken as he's leaving, and it cuts to an extreme close up of his face as he's listening to what the guy's about to say, and right that time. I get a phone call from LT, uh-huh. and so I pick it up, talk to him a little bit, and I said, well, I'm paused watching the movie right now that you let me borrow, and he said, what's happening? I was like, uh, I'm at a shot right now where uh, Christopher Walken's looking right into the camera. He's like, oh, man, wait till you see what he does next. <laughs> And so I, right after that, I hit play, and all of a sudden, turns around, bam, bam, bam. Yeah, he's just a stone cold killer. Like, he just, he just wants to climb up to be, you know, this. I don't know how to, like, he's not a bad guy, but he just wants to do good. And this, it kind of reminds me of the kingpin, kingpin in a way of, you know, Daredevil in the Spider-Man universe. Like, he wants to do good yet he's doing crime to succeed in doing what he wants to help the city out yeah conflict of interest it's when I first saw the trailer I was like whoa this film's gonna be amazing I mean of course if you're an adult out there there's a lot of tits out there there's a lot of tits in the film especially a lot of boobage Mm-hmm. Some drugs, like cocaine. So, if you want action, it's mostly about action. I mean, there's not a lot of story. A lot of bang, bang, shoot 'em up kind of feels. Yeah, and this is. I think this was Abel Ferreira, director Abel Ferreira's um, high point in his career was this film in Bad Lieutenant. I, I remember watching the first. Uh, the first movie he ever directed, The Driller Killer. Mm-hmm. Worst, I was like, 
this is one of the worst horror films I've ever seen. So, finding out that he went from that to making this, which actually I can call a movie, was uh, was pretty impressive. Yeah, he's Abel Fiera has done a lot of films in his career, like Driller Killer, as you said. This Forty Five is another example. Back in the eighties, God, I love that film so much. Uh, and Bad Lieutenant, like. Like I said, a lot of people didn't like this film. People like Bad Lieutenant more than the King of New York. Mm-hmm. It's it's one of those. It's not underrated, but it's just it's a film that if you want to see Christopher Walken being a badass, killing people, go see it. And yeah. If you're, it's 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 like I have nothing to say about it really. It's just it's a film that I thought I would like, but it's not. It's just one quirky moment in it, and that's it. And it's the rest is just like I almost fell asleep during it. It was just like okay, really. Hmm. Yikes. Anyway, usually, I mean, I watched The King of New York first, and then I was like, okay. I almost did a sleep and solo, but I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> for, for those audience members listening, the sleeping Sullivan is, is a, is a term coined by the fact that I have gone to sleep many a time while watching movies with these guys. But it's only because, unlike some folks here, I actually have a job. I have a job. I wasn't talking about you. Burn, 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 burn. <laughs> okay. Right, but it's Christopher Walken, you know, he's a he's a legend in the business, you know, he, everybody loves him for who he is. Like, mm-hmm. like people know him for the modern walking walking for being walking, you know, his crazy crazy outbursts and overacting to be honest. I mean, if you look at his early stuff, you know, he's got some Oscar-nominated worthy roles. Like, if you want to see him actually good acting, check out The Deer Hunter. He actually won an award for Best Supporting Actor in that film. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you know, hopefully we have some good prospects in the future. I mean, he's have some good films coming up, I believe. What I believe he was going to be voicing a character for the upcoming... Jungle Book mo- movie? Yes. It's gonna be King Louie. <laughs> yes, and it's gonna be for the Disney one, too. So you never know. Maybe he'll do a cover. That's another thing we didn't mention, we didn't talk too much about here, is how is walking, singing, and dancing roles. Is, uh... Well, that's the thing. He was gonna major in dancing... In college, but he dropped out to do acting. So he's got a lot of influence in dancing. That's why, in every film, he tries to do like a dance scene, whether the script permits it or not. Well, I, I haven't honestly, from the roles that I've seen him in, like I haven't really seen a lot of his like dancing performances. I mean, I'll be honest, even the Peter Pan live one, there really isn't a lot of dancing in there. Like, um, compared to the stuff that I've seen where he did dance, like in the um, uh, Weapon of Choice music video, or in, the or in Hairspray, like, yeah. that is a da- that is, that truly showcases, like, um, uh, Christopher Watkins' literal song and dance routines. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. but I haven't seen quite a lot, but mm. it, it, like, I'll admit, the dude can dance. He can definitely mm-hmm. can. Oh yeah, he's really good at dancing. Oh, yeah. Peter Pan Live, he wasn't given much to work with, but... You no, know, Hairspray and other stuff. Yeah. We want more walking, singing, and dancing. Mm-hmm. And more <laughs> walking his puss in boots. <laughs> oh, jeez. Wait, what? <gasps> That's right. That's... Oh, yes, there's a film called Puss in Boots, and Walken played Puss 
Boots and Boots. Wh- when? Where? What? It was a live action film from the 90s, I believe. I can't remember what the year was. 80s, I think. I thought it was like like the early ni- 90s, I believe. That Or is that late 80s? Puss in Boots, 1988. Puss in Boots. And he plays a... I don't know, it's like, uh, it's a live action role, like he must have turned into a, turned into a human, I guess? No, cat turned into a human. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see, like, apparently they must have had, like, an animated thing in the beginning, because, like, I'm on the IMDB page, and, like, in the videos you see a live action walk-in, and on the other side you see an animated cat. Yep. There's your weird film of the day from Christopher Walken. Puss in Boots. I gotta bring mm-hmm. that back. Well, technically, they are bringing it back. But unfortunately, he's being outshined by Antonio Banderas. And the guy that pretends to be Antonio Banderas on Netflix, so... Well, that's it for this uh, a podcast, Torino. We had uh, a great time talking about Christopher Walken. Now here's something that should be interesting for all of us on Cinema Royale. I'm doing something a little different. We're doing another franchise. Um, we're having a guest coming on for the episode. Um, I believe his name... Oh, fuck, I can't remember his name now. Fuck. I'm Paul Z. Hack. Oh yeah, Matt. Paulo Z. Hack. Post oh, had. now I remember what we're doing. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes. So, God, if I can't, I, sorry if I can't remember his name or not. So, I probably put it in post. But he does monstrosities like kaiju vlog, and we agreed on talking about uh, Gamera films. Gamera. The Gamera. Gamera franchise. I don't know how many of us are gonna be on this episode, so. It's going to be an obscure little episode for us. There's 12 films in the franchise. We might see 11 of them, because I don't have Gamera the Brave. I have all 11 films. We're going to talk about each film, possibly the aspects of Gamera. Why Gamera is underrated compared to Godzilla, obviously. A lot of other stuff. And that'll be on June 14th. Kick up the summer right with some giant monsters, motherfuckers. With a giant mm-hmm. turtle. The original mutant turtle. Hey, mm-hmm. turtles! <laughs> turtle. 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 So, if you like this episode, please give us a like. Please tell me in the comments below what is your favorite Christopher Walken performance. And. Uh, make sure you subscribe for more Cinema Royale. There's coming up bi-weekly. Make sure you watch out this week because I'm coming out with a new podcast called He's a Phantom Podcast where we talk about Danny Phantom, the underrated Nickelodeon show, going episode by episode of the show and talk about our feelings about the show since its cancellation. Mm-hmm. Gotta catch him all because he's Danny Phantom. Other than that, thanks for watching this obscurely random Christopher Walken episode. Until then, adios amigos. Ciao for now. We would like to apologize if throughout the entire episode there was a very, very excruciating lack of cowbell. And for that, we are sorry. gonna break!